grateful for your time once again here on New Day. Uh, the newspaper segment is just about taking off. The Ghanaian Times this morning says elimination of double track system, 804 senior high school project near completion. Uh, a photograph of the uh, education minister is here. Be circumspect in kidnappings reportage. Uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament is saying this. A lot to talk about Nigeria, Ghana this morning. The finder says profitable business ignored. Guinea fowl farmers are crying for help. Two ki Kumase kidnappers caged and don't attack Nigerians, uh, MPs. The Daily Graphic has the story from uh, the uh, Awasu bauxite area where we're told that uh, workers set buildings and vehicles ablaze. It's here on the Daily Graphic. The publisher, Ghanaians attack Nigerians in Kumase. Uh, Ochredaku fires warning. That's the story. Limping kidnapper on remand over two Canadian girls. A lot to talk about Ghana and Nigeria this morning. My guest to do the talking extreme left is a deputy national youth organizer of the NDC, Eric Edem Agbana. Eric, good morning. Good morning. Hope Mark. you're doing great. Fantastic. Thanks for morning. joining us. Your, your namesake, Eric Chum, is here. He's a member of the NPP's team. Eric, good morning, too. Good morning. Uh, I didn't know he was called Eric. Yeah. 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 He decided, he decided hidden, to hide here. He's hidden yeah. it from me. Yeah. Yeah. That's why um, I have I a, a soft spot for him. Oh, OK. Uh, I see. He's a bit naughty, but. Mother uh, <laughs> 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 Rodayada is a member of the CPP. <laughs> Gentlemen and ladies, good morning once again. Good morning. Good morning. Grateful for your morning with me here in the studios. Now, let's start with Ghana, Nigeria. Um, so many stories. If you take a look at the Daily Guide this morning, the Vice President is expected to meet uh, Guta, that is the, the Ghana Union of Trade Association, and the Nigerians to deal with the issue of uh, foreigners in uh, uh, retail trade. Also, on the Ghana-Nigeria issue, we're told that uh, MPs are worried about the fact that Ghanaians are attacking uh, Nigerian traders. That's another side of the story. The media has been told to be circumspect in kidnapping reportage. Uh, the issue of uh, insisting that uh, two Nigerians arrested. And also, again, the uh, Nigerian High Commissioner's statement uh, suggesting that uh, Ghana should take it cool as far as their issues as so it's a part of Ghana Nigeria issue but if you take a look at the daily uh, guide this morning MPs on page six uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee met yesterday and said the leadership of the committee have expressed great concern over attempts by some Ghanaians to prejudge crimes allegedly committed by Nigerian mm -hmm. residents in the country and reported attacks on Nigerians in Kumasi following the kidnapping of the two Canadian ladies in Kumasi a fortnight ago. So this story is well known. Let me start the conversation with Eric. So I I Eric, this is a problem that is not new, the fact that Niger Ghanaian uh, businessmen in retail trade are not too happy about uh, their counterparts uh, from Nigeria. But perhaps we didn't solve that problem, and today due to what is happening, the kidnappings, we're seeing the attacks again. Is there a way we can, we can stop the attacks? Yeah, Brad, good morning to you and mm. to our cherished viewers across the world. Um, I'm excited to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm sure that if you see me wearing this red uh, beret and the red shirt under, uh, it's just to create awareness for the Kumiya Preko demonstration that the Coalition for Social Justice will embark on come July 2nd this year. Uh, it is a protest against high level of insecurity, economic hardship, and oppression in this country. I'm sure we'll find a more appropriate time to talk about that. But I want to say good morning to our uh, viewers and just for them to know that that is the rationale behind our communicators uh, wearing the red T-shirt because come 2nd July, uh, about 20,000 Ghanaians will be on the street to march against hardship and, and insecurity in this country. Talking about the Ghana-Nigeria issue, I agree with the members of parliament uh, as they are asking the media and everybody else to be circumspect when it comes to the reportage on uh, alleged crimes involving not just Nigerians but foreign nationals. Mm. The Nigerian community is a very, very huge community in Ghana. Uh, I listened to the president of the Nigerian uh, residents in Ghana Association and he was quoting the figure of about 7 million Nigerians in Ghana. And I'm not surprised because as far back as 1931, 
uh, Nigerians constituted the single largest group of, of immigrant residents in Ghana. And it has always been so. Even when you go to our universities, uh, majority of our foreign students are Nigerian students. And so this issue regarding Nigerians and the perception that Nigerians are engaging in crime is an issue that we ought to be very, very careful with. Especially when you go back to Nigeria also, and our High Commissioner tells us that we have about 2 million Ghanaians living in Nigeria. Now, when you have about 7 million Nigerians in Ghana engaging in all sorts of activities, whether for educational purpose, trade, and some are married here and all of those things, then you have a situation where a few bad nuts engage in a crime. Mm. And what is even more shocking is that this particular issue came about because of the alleged kidnapping, the, 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 the Canadian 2 issue, where you have about eight people arrested, two Nigerians, and when you watch, I mean, when you read the headlines, most of the news as they were reporting as Nigerians responsible for the kidnapping of the Canadians. When you have six Ghanaians also as part of those who have been arrested. So obviously if I'm a Nigerian or if you know what it means for Ghana and Nigeria to cooperate, you'll be concerned about the kind of reportage that you see. Ghana and Nigeria has always had a very cordial relationship. Mm -hmm. And we have two incidents in our history in the history of the two, the two countries where I pray that we don't get there. In 1969, when the Buzia-led uh, government declared or announced the, the, the Aliens Compliance uh, Order, right. which, 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 which led to, I mean, some form of revolt against Nigerians living in Ghana. And in 1983, when they decided to uh, reciprocate that act, Ghana suffered a lot when it comes to the economic uh, benefit because we had a lot of Ghanaians who were teachers, traders, nurses, doctors working in Nigeria that left in that operation. Ghana must go. And it didn't all go well for the two countries. But when you look at our relationship now, Ghana's best friend in the West African sub-region, we all know, is Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And we collaborate on so many things, even in the entertainment industry. Not to too long ago, we see things like the Ghana meets Niger. We see how our artists and, and even in the movie industry, how they relate, how they come together and they perform together and all of those things. It fosters some unity among these two big countries in the West African sub-region. Come to the issues about energy, the West African gas pipeline and all of those things. So Ghana and Nigeria has always found a common ground to work together and to cooperate. So when you have a situation where there is crime involving some citizens from either countries mm. and the reportage centers on the foreigners to create an impression that it is these foreigners that are creating a problem for us we all have a cause to to be worried especially when you look at international relations and diplomacy diplomatic relationship between two countries mm. there is something about municipal laws and the municipal laws simply talks about the concept that in as much as you may have, let's say, ECOWAS, the AU, granting some uh, immunities or giving some cooperation conditionalities and all of those things, it is incumbent on the host country to ensure that its security uh, agencies ensure that whether you're a foreigner or you're a, you are, you are a national, I mean a local national, your laws are made to work. So when we do not allow our security agencies to do the proper work, and whether foreigners or Ghanaians are caught in issues of kidnapping, we cannot blame it on the Nigerians. It is incumbent on us to build our security architecture and infrastructure in such a way that it becomes difficult for anybody, whether, whether, whether a Ghanaian citizen or a foreign citizen, to flout our laws. So when a criminal is caught, deal with the person as a criminal, not as a Nigerian, not as a, a Togolese, not as a Ghanaian. Just deal with the person. The laws are there. So the Nigerian High Commissioner has a case. He, he's, he's raising legitimate they, concerns. They, they do, because, because when you look at our history, I, I agree with him because if, if the principle of reciprocity is applied here and Nigerians begin to treat Ghanaians living in Nigeria the way some of our media houses create the impression we have problems. About a month or so ago, okay, up two me. Ghanaians were deported from Nigeria. That shows that it's a country that they're allowing the laws to work. 
If you go there, whether you're a Ghanaian, you're a Nigerian, you find yourself in any country, you ought to respect the laws of the land. So when you are, when you are caught or you are seen flouting the laws of that land, the laws must deal with you as an individual, not necessarily because you, you are a you citizen are from, uh, of a particular, a particular country. country. Okay, uh, Adam, I'm grateful. Eric, the, the vice president is, is expected to sit in a meeting between the, the Ghanaian uh, traders and the Nigerians. What steps should be taken to deal with this? Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, Eric, Agben, Adam, <laughs> <laughs> and Madam. Uh, I mean, I, and then also, of course, to yourself and then the viewers out there. Uh, because Adam has taken the angle of the insecurity issues to do with reporting of crime, uh, purported to have been undertaken by Nigerians or some foreigners. Uh, I think that I will basically go the route of the the trade um, conversation that has been festering for a while. Right. Uh, we are signatories to the ETLS, which is the ECOWAS uh, protocol uh, when it comes to trade, where you have a certain allowance of free movement of goods and services and people mm. across the sub-region. Uh, and for me, I think that we also have to uh, contextualize the conversation when it comes to that. Whilst Adem was speaking, he made uh, allusions to the fact that we have uh, a certain number of Ghanaians also uh, involved in all sorts of activities in Nigeria, mm. close to two million or even over. Could be more. Uh, could even be more. Mm. And so sometimes they call for circumspection it's actually very important and apt. So whilst uh, there's a certain um, orientation to say that, well, we have certain laws within our statutes that states that uh, uh, foreigners cannot, I mean, engage in some retail trade and all of those things, uh, we would also have to ask ourselves if that in itself is being um, executed in its strictest form, even in Nigeria or other parts of the, the sub-region. I believe strongly that, especially when uh, we've also even uh, appended our signature to the ACFTA, which is the Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is meant to be a Pan-African uh, single trade market, we would have even a lot more people coming in. So the conversation surrounding who is meant to be uh, engaging in retail trade within our various markets and all of those things should extend beyond that. Mm. Uh, whilst there's a certain, uh, if you like, advantage when people come in here, there's also advantages for us to be able to uh, clearly take when we also expose our Ghanaian entrepreneurs and uh, traders to other markets across the sub-region. So it's, a, it's almost like a, a give and take thing. Um, I think that's important that um, the Vice President, uh, together with the Trade Ministry, is doing what they're doing in terms of engaging the various uh, stakeholders, that is the Ghanaian uh, traders, Guta, mm. who have some legitimate concerns, and then the Nigerian counterparts as well, who also have some legitimate concerns, to come to a certain consensus so that this whole idea of, uh, I mean, it's almost as if that um, some persecution of people who are purportedly coming from Nigeria would, would cease. So that we would have a certain harmonious relationship which has existed from time immemorial. I mean, there are families involved and business partnerships and all sorts of various interests across the various uh, countries, which for me is imperative that we, uh, we keep it as it is. Mm. And then also find solution to some of the challenges that we face in the market. I mean, uh, and then of course the call for circumspection, even when it comes to the, the issue issues. of uh, reporting of crime and all of those things. It's it's probably a certain global, uh, if you like, challenge. Where, for instance, you find a Ghanaian in England somewhere who has lived there all their lives, or even has. Uh, very strong connections. Even some people are actually born there. But the moment something happens which is on tour, they'll say, oh, uh, a British man of a Ghanaian descent or something. So it's, it's happened. I mean, I don't think that some of the reportages just 
peculiar to, to Ghana. But we have to show some circumspection. Uh, I don't believe that every single Nigerian in this country is in, indulged in uh, criminal activities and all of those things. And like we said, the issue today with some of the bad now should be dealt with. The mm. security apparatus should be such that we'll be able to, one, uh, forestall some of these things. And even if it does happen, uh, should be able to act in a manner that one will get to uh, the bottom of the issues and act with some kind of alacrity so that even when the issues have happened, we're able to apprehend the culprits so that it's not an issue of either, either the Ghanaians or the Nigerians, but mm -hmm. that our laws are working. And of course, I mean, it's a call to everybody who comes into this country to obey the laws of this land and also send a strong signal that regardless of who it is, once these things happen, when you flout the laws of this country, you'll be dealt with. And I think that if you're able to deal with that in that manner, where there's a certain fairness and transparency in the way the law is applied, we would not be able to face some of these challenges. But okay. the call that we have to be circumspect is key because we I think that for us it's important that we maintain that cordial relationship that we have with uh, Nigeria. It's actually in the benefit of both countries for us to be uh, in tandem when it comes to some of these things. Because mm -hmm. even if you look at Ghana, for instance, uh, we are actually surrounded by French-speaking countries. And when you look at our colonial past and when it comes to uh, the issue of being colonized by the English and all of those things. We have a lot more in common, funny enough, with even Nigeria than even some yeah. of the countries that we actually share borders with. And this is a long age old tradition that I, as far as I'm concerned, we need to maintain and make it a bit stronger and even go beyond the sub-region as a market hub. For instance, we'll be talking about the uh, continental free trade area. Once we're able to do so, mm. we have access to 1.4 billion Africans. Now that becomes a market that one, when you go into the international or the global stage when it comes to negotiations, you're able to go there on a better and with, with a better leverage to be able to bring something back to Africa. Mm. And even trading amongst ourselves. Now, if you look at the intra-Africa trade, for instance, it's, actually, it's abysmal. You know, so we have a situation we where prefer to go out yeah, we prefer to ourselves. go out and we're trading with other countries and everything. But the market is here. Try traveling across Africa and see how difficult it is. So the opportunities are bound. And mm. so we cannot use some of these little things which are essentially uh, obstacles to derail something that for me, Africa has been clamoring for okay. since uh, the uh, independent era, since 1957 when Nkrumah and Co. were, we're calling talking about for unity, and all, unity and all of those things. So we need to be able to be minded by a certain global trend. Ghanaians are everywhere. Mm. Other people would also come into our, our country. But of course, it's imperative that they go or they stick by the rules and regulations that we have in the country. But, 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 but that, so we cannot shut our doors to uh, uh, foreigners. But when they start complaining that we're treating them unfairly, what do we do? Um, I'd like to say good morning mm. to everyone and to our panelists here as well. Um, right, Ghana, Nigeria, it's a very delicate issue. Mm. Um, like my two co panelists have said, we have a long-standing relationship with them. But you see, we have to look at the things that are happening around in two phases. One of it is economic. When you have a people that are threatened by the influx of another group of people, definitely they're going to fight. That is one of the issues. Um, we are in a country of th about 30 million people, 27, mm. 30 million people. And if you have another 7 million unplanned people coming in, then everything is overstretched. And therefore, the indigents, by all means, will fight. So it's not just a question of um, them having to be allowed to trade. Mm. But then it's a question of, is there space to allow for that number to come in? That is the issue. Because we are in a country where even our accommodation is stretched because of the influx that is coming. Our uh, utilities, everything is overstretched. When you have that kind of influx coming in, it becomes a big problem. 
we cannot look at the drop, that is us, the 2 million, in a country of 200 million and compare it to 7 million in a country of 30 million. So the question is this. The numbers that we are having here, we have very law-abiding Nigerians in this country. Mm. We have Nigerians that are here working really hard in this country. But how about the other group of Nigerians who are giving them a bad name? How do we manage that group? So we are looking at our immigration service. Are they up and doing? Yes, we are members of ECOWAS. It entitles us to stay in any country for 90 days. After that, you re regularize your stay mm. or you go away. Are we doing that? We are not. Because what is happening is people are just coming in under the guise of ECOWAS and staying. There's no tracking of what There's they do. There's no tracking of what they do. And once you have that, you have people just coming in. They can just rent apartments. They can buy land and build. They can go and open shops. They can do anything that they want to do it will definitely create a problem. It is left to us as a people to demand that the agencies that are supposed to make sure that they are law abiding, they come in, they stay, they go. If they want to trade, these are the laws, these are the processes. You go through them and we have no problem. But when you start attacking members of our immigration with impunity, because you feel that we are also there, and therefore you can do that. We should not allow that. As a country, we are open. I belong to a, a party that believes in African integration. We believe in African unification. But at the same time, we believe in the fact that you must be law abiding. You have to go by the rules. We cannot just open our doors and accept anyone and everyone mm. to just come in and stay because that is not what happens when you go to Nigeria. And we're talking. I mean, when I read what the High Commissioner is saying, I'm asking myself, please, I also read Nigerian news. And when they're reporting, they say Ghanaians. They don't just say anybody. They also attack us. Far from that, is it so easy for a Ghanaian to actually do a business in Nigeria? Please go and find out. There are certain places you cannot even put a, a table to sell bread. But we allow them on our streets to sell everything. So we are actually opening our arms to them. And we expect that they would go by the law. They would abide by the law, do the processes, the right processes. Mm. It, there is no law that states that as soon as you come and marry a Ghanaian, you're a Nigerian, you're entitled to go buy land. And they know it. But they, they flout all these laws with impunity. That is where we have to be looking at. Is it because we, we don't enforce our laws? That's what I'm saying. They, they, they our laws. The institutions are not working. They've seen that loophole. So they're coming in. And now when they come in, they take the space that we don't have. They take the space. I mean, if you talk to the ordinary Ghanaian on the streets today, the person is going to tell that they've taken all our, our, our housing because they are ready to pay more. They've taken their shops because they are ready to pay more. Why? Because they have an economy that is strong. So let's build our economy. Let's begin to build our economy so that our people can also have access to that and, and be able to stay. Let's face it, as politicians, we deal with our other political components over there. So definitely you have a rapport with a, a, a political party in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So by all means, you will be, you, as a government, you'll be thinking about, if I do this, it's going to affect me. As we sit, whenever we are going to do anything, we are thinking about oil, first thing. Oh, they are going to stop giving us the oil because we don't have the money to pay for the oil upfront. So a lot of the things we don't want to bite, but we must bite. We must let them understand that you can't take us for granted. You are allowed into this country just like we are allowed into your country, but you have to go by the laws. You abide by the laws and we are all family. You know, right, um, after the uh, aliens compliance order, a lot of Nigerians went back home with their families. These Nigerians were born in Ghana. They had Ghanaian citizenship. They schooled in this country. Now, their grandchildren are coming back. Some of them, their children, are coming back and claiming that citizenship. So we must draw a line between those who have come back because they feel they are Ghanaian, and they believe they are Ghanaian, rightly so. And then those who have just taken an, a due advantage of the fact that we are gullible, so they can come in and play us around. I am for... African unification and um, for ECOWAS, and we must bear in mind that we are going to have the ECO, which is going to be our trade currency, currency. so to speak.
So we are going to get, like um, Eric said, a lot more people coming in. And until our immigration services are up and doing, our police services are up and doing, to curb crime, we're going to be in for a lot more trouble. So, so, so let's just stick by the rules. Mm. We still see them as our elder brothers, as they want us to see them. But they must treat us with respect. And obey our laws. Yeah. Okay. Grateful. Ghanaian Times this morning says the 804 senior high school projects near completion. Work on 804 infrastructural project targeted at eliminating the double track system across the country uh, are near completion. Uh, they fall under the senior high school intervention project being financed with government funds and part of the 1.5 billion uh, dollar Ghana Educational Trust Fund earmarked for the financing of educational infrastructure in various senior high schools across the country. Uh, if you take a look at the story, Ashanti region has uh, 218, uh, Bonahafu region, Eight to six. I don't know why the Times is still referring to Bonafo region. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, Central Eastern Central has one twenty six. Eastern, no, I'm getting it right. Okay, Eastern region has one hundred and twenty six. Forty eight in Greater Accra. Eighty one in Northern uh, region. Um, Upper East region thirty six. Upper West fourteen. Volta uh, forty three. Western. Uh, the Times is still uh, referring to them in their old names. But that's the story. Uh, the head of public relations at the Minister of Education, Vincent Asifua, uh, said that they include classrooms, dormitories, assembly halls, and other critical infrastructure needed at senior high schools. Eric, let me start the conversation with you. Um, the story says that this is an attempt to get rid of double track in three years instead of the five to seven years that it was earmarked, suggesting that we're on course. Yes. Um for me, it's a, it's a brilliant uh, story. Uh, it's one of the things that we should uh, commend ourselves for, uh, especially the conviction of the president and the work that has been done thus far by the Ministry of Education to deal with this matter. Um, I think that any time we speak about the free SHS, uh, you always get ten, uh, a certain feeling that all that people speak about is the, the negatives or the challenges that uh, would essentially befall any policy that is executed at that scale. But as we speak now, we have close to 900,000 young graduates, um, Ghanaians, benefiting from the free SHS. You can have certain disquiets, you can complain about certain aspects of it in terms of space and people have spoken about bed bags and all of those things. But I look at it from a perspective, at what point were we going to start? There are close to 180,000 of these young people who hitherto would not have had an opportunity to go to uh, senior high school by dint of the fact that their parents or guardians just couldn't afford it. And I've always maintained that this whole conversation around free SHS is a social and a moral issue as well. How do you actually sleep in an era where, especially uh, in the rural areas, where a, a, a chunk of our resources, uh, the contribution to our GDP, actually comes from, by virtue of the fact that these parents are farmers or as fishermen, fisher folk, or subsistence, or traders, they do not have enough money to take their kids to school. And then we can sit in this country and see nothing wrong with that. So it's, it's essentially a moral issue. And I would commend the president any day for showing the conviction that even regardless of all the challenges, we will do this thing. Apart from these facilities, close to 9,000 teachers were recruited to support the, 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 the free SHS in terms of the double track system. When we started, 400 schools were part of the, uh, the double track system. As we speak, last year, it had dropped to 100. And they, like you've just read, they're actually on course to make sure that in the next uh, academic year or so, young people will not have to go through the double track system. But we have given opportunities to young people 
who would be able to use the education that they get at a second cycle level mm -hmm. to do other things and also contribute their quota to, to the development of this country. So for me, I think that while some of the challenges, I went to Form 1 in 1986, all these things that we are talking about today existed. And so when people say that because of the free SHS, that's the reason why we have broken beds and the nets are not working and the kids do not like the food and everything. I sit back and I'm saying, we are not very sincere with ourselves in this country. There's no if, pressure on the facilities? If, yeah, there's pressure. But okay. the thing is that that is what has been done. And I would even say that even successive governments have done what they could. But maybe we haven't done enough. But the point is that the challenges that we are facing within our second cycle institution was not as a result of free SHS. Of course, it put some pressure. But that's why the government also thought outside of the box. And I keep asking myself, so whose children should have been allowed to stay at home whilst all the things that we're talking about in terms of should be put in place before the implementation? Mm -hmm. Whose children should have been allowed to stay at home or not get the benefit of the second uh, cycle education. People have made uh, mention of the fact that, well, those who can pay should pay and everything. And I laugh. And you see, you put yourself in the shoes of parents. We were, you were, we were in school. We were in school where people could barely even bring in Gary to school. And you their think, parents, you, their you, parents could think pay. our ministers cannot pay for their uh, water. Listen, SHS but that, those, when you look at the numbers mm. in terms of how that contribution, it is minimal. You see, we talk about it as if when you go to school and your parents pay your school fees, that's it. I've been in school with people who bring a big bag of, um, what do you call it, a pillowcase of Gary, mm. and that's all they could bring, even though their parents could pay their school fees. And they were in school with other kids whose parents were bank managers and directors and everything who were bringing everything. And that actually even affects education. Uh, you I were see. in school with people who parents could pay school fees but could not buy uniforms. So somebody goes to form one to assist form and is probably wearing the same shorts for seven years. All these things happen. Now parents can actually, those who could even afford, cannot buy provisions for their kids, can buy uniforms for their kids, can even save some monies to either uh, invest in, uh, in property or something for their futures. So you are working for 25, 30 years, and all you use your money for is to pay school fees for your kids. You see, so people are looking at it from a very, if you like, parochial self-interest perspective. I see. Where parents would now benefit from the free SHS, and even the kids who hitherto would have done other things, would not, have, would not be doing those things so that they have an opportunity to contribute their quota. Because you see, you can't develop any country. We keep talking about this. Le, le, I'm can't not cutting in, but it, what the story did not tell us, it, it only says that the, the project, 804 of, uh, uh, schools, were started in 2017. Do you have the final details of, of this? Yes, I, there's a breakdown in terms okay. of regions and all of those okay. things. Yeah. Okay. So that one is in here. I, yeah. I wanted to know whether these projects were new, initiated. So or over here, mm. the, over here, it says that new projects is close to 764. Okay, so some and then are new. Yeah, are new. And then some of the rehabilitation and all of those things adds up to the 804. But I'm saying that it's a step in the right direction. Okay. Of course, other things need to be done. We okay. need to improve the sector. They're talking about new curriculum and all of those things. But the truth of the matter is that it's imperative that we encourage the government, we commend government for showing conviction to implementing this thing. I'm grateful. Let me go to Eric Adam Agbena to come in. So he says that government is in, in the offing to eliminate double track. He's talking about commendation. Right. I, I think that is very interesting listening to my brother Eric talk about the free SHS and, and the double track issue. And he made a very instructive statement that he loves when he hears people say those who can pay should pay. I must say that one of the leading advocates for that kind of free SHS is actually their finance minister, uh, the Honorable Ken Uforiata, who has said uh, on occasions that he thinks that this country should get back to the drawing board, look at the free SHS policy, and those, that's what, that's what and, and those who can pay should, should pay. Because he used himself as an example when he said that, I mean, imagine his child is in a secondary school where he can afford to pay. Why should it be the burden of government? So 
I mean, it's instructive to know that he's laughing at his finance minister's position. <laughs> this no, issue I, about... I, I, no, no, I, I, but, but, I, I, but I, I, that's exactly I, I, what he said. Pretend you, you didn't no, hear no, that. That's, that's, that's mischievous. No, that's not mischievous. I mean, that is what. Yes. But I still stand by my... Right, right. This double-track issue and the fact that the government is even now running away from their five to seven years plan and the accompanying challenges that came with free SHS only vindicates the NDC's position that the free SHS one was not well thought through and it was just a campaign promise that they wanted to fulfill at so all costs. There are not 900,000 Because in any serious the country, in any serious democracy, yeah. Before you implement a major intervention, like the senior house, like the free SHS, you ought to even know the numbers. You should know the cost. And you know which institutions, I mean which schools, are going to receive what numbers. So you started, it came with challenges, it's like we have a knee-jerk reaction. And it, we cannot be playing with our educational system in this manner. Right. When you look at the SDG4, <coughs> which talks about inclusive education and the fact that no child must be left behind. That for me is a well-intentioned action plan that any country that wants to achieve some progress in education must be following. But in doing that, there are three key things that should be of concern to all of us as citizens. The first one is the accessibility. So you can have a free SHS, you can have the secondary schools you are not paying, in fact you can even start giving books, food, and everything for free. But when a child cannot access the school, it means that the person cannot even benefit. The second one is the affordability, which this government is only focusing on because that is, in fact, very populist, and that is what will guarantee them some votes as they are thinking. And the third one, which is the most important one in any serious educational system, is quality. That is what we are lacking as we are speaking, right? Take a trip to all the secondary schools and speak to the students. We have reduced the whole educational system to just emphasis on, oh, just come in. You see, and half-baked education is more dangerous than no education at all. So this government must eat the humble pie and admit that at the time they were starting the free SHS policy, they didn't think through it very well. It didn't even come with a policy document. I mean, how? How can you implement a very important policy as the free secondary school policy without even a policy document such that every year you have changes being made to the policy in such a way that just to suit media attention and their their populist agenda to gather votes in the next election when in fact this president was the one who kept saying that we need a, we needed a government that thinks about the next generation and not the next election right what is even more interesting is that but government but is he's supposed so, he's to be... Uh, to the uh, no, 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 no. I, 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 no, I, no you, you, you made a lot of, you a lot you, of factual and yeah, inaccurate okay, statements, but I kept quiet. I kept my cool. Okay. Right, what is even more interesting for me and for all of us as Ghanaians is that the previous government, you speak for all headed guys. by President John Dramani Mahama, had a vision of building 200 community day senior high schools. At the time that President Mahama left office, 125 had started. It's not true. About 48 were completed, and the others were in various stages of completion. He's telling me it's not true. But you see, we published the list of all the schools and the communities and where they are even located. I can bring that list out for you. Now, if you have 48 or 50 out of the 125 completed, and you have a government that indeed claims that they are interested in expanding infrastructure to accommodate the extra numbers, Ask them, why are you not completing the community day senior high schools that they started? But, uh, but for the community day senior high schools, but for the community day senior high schools, the challenges that came with the free SHS in 2017, 2018 would have been worse. Today, as I sit here, right, I'm excited that the vision of President John Mahama has come into reality such that even when you are talking about the national science and math quiz as we speak, Three of the community days in their high schools have made it to the finals in Legon. Fafraha, Kwabenya, and one other. Fafraha will be in action against my old school, Maoli school, and all of that. 
It tells you that that vision is something that if you had paid some proper attention and taken time to complete all these schools, all this burden about the senior high school and then the double track system would have been eliminated. Again, this government is fond of giving outrageous numbers where doesn't no action accompanies it. I will challenge them. And I'm challenging Eric the and the government that they should publish the list of 804 according to the region. It's not enough to tell me that Volta region... That's a regional breakdown. Yeah, okay. No, you know, I'm not talking about okay. regional breakdown. It is easy for me to take 804 and divide it by 16 regions and try and do some allocations. We know them. We want them to publish that, for example, OT region. These are the 32 school projects that, 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 that we're doing. And, and like the way the NDC published the 125 senior high schools that we were constructing. We didn't just publish the districts. We gave specific locations, communities, and all of that. I'm challenging them that if indeed 804 projects are ongoing, they should bring it out and then list them. One thing I know for sure is that in some of the schools, some of the schools, PTA-sponsored projects that have been, that started long ago, are also being counted among their projects <laughs> to accommodate the extra numbers. We know them. I'm challenging them Let me get to Madame bring the numbers. We can do some comments. Actually, give us two minutes. Uh, Madam Rhoda will come in and then we'll, we'll take some comments. Yes, let's do this quickly. We have some comments from our viewers at home. And this one says, uh, Good morning, Bright. Ghanaians, Nigerians, and some of our sisters and brothers from other countries are seriously crying for protection, yet all the assurance that we get from this myopic government is Ghana is safe. Bright, clearly this shows that this government is not up and doing so far as security of this nation is concerned. Our Mohammed sent that one. Adam Hardy uh, Saxes from Tamale says, good morning. The Foreign Affairs Committee invites the Nigerian High Commissioner and people and the media should be circumspect in their comment. If you make Xenophobic, uh, xenophobic reportage claim, you got to provide material evidence, else your claims remain frivolous and calculated at damaging Ghana's reputation. Pajo sent this one from Kwadaso Onion Market, and he says, I think Ghanaians should not be emotional about what the Nigerian professor said, and let's interrogate what he said and get to improve on uh, on our security. We are not used to such hard truths, but you and I know that standards are falling. The earlier we address the situation, the better for Ghana. Uh, and that's what he says. Um, Michael Amening sent that one, and he says that um, the reckless comments by the visiting English Nigerian professor is very unfortunate and regrettable because there are lots of Nigerians who are in all sorts of criminal activities, and he should spare our ears with his hypocrisy and propaganda because his conduct is rather inciting serious or slaughter against Nigerians. Uh, that's what he says. Uh, so the IGP has joined the search for uh, joined the search for the Canadian girls but the Taddy girls dear we didn't hear from him uh, this is coming from Taddy boy from Cape Coast um, this one also says uh, this is Ghana where Akufuado promised us heaven but today we're living in hell amidst insecurity and high cost of living no other Nigerians and other foreign nationals have taken advantage of current paralyzed leadership to make the lives of Ghanaians more uncomfortable. Surely 2021 must be Ghana's year of freedom with John Mahama as president. Charles Nyame sent that one from Asaman Kese. And this one says, good morning, Bright. When Madame Ayana is on your program, Joy is always on my face because she's always been a nationalist. Crimes in Ghana does not mean insecurity. All those security forces are doing their best. Who do sent that one from Damango? Uh, good morning, Senior Bright and Aisha. I blame the media entirely for these crimes. Uh, crime is crime, but whenever suspects are arrested, the media is quick to highlight the suspects' nationalities, especially if they are Nigerians, painting a picture that Nigerians are bad people. Do we expect only Father Christmas to enter our country when our borders are always open for everyone? Don't we have laws to regulate and check entry? Now we blame Nigerians for everything. I'll say in Europe, we would have uh, described it as racist, but here we are as Africans stereotyping each other. It is very bad. We all belong to one Africa. We better realize that if we want to progress as a people. Uh, good morning, Bright. The issue of kidnapping is really disturbing us as a country. I associate myself with the members of parliament, cautioning the media to be circumspect in their reportage with respect 
to kidnappings. I'm very positive that the security agencies will surely address the phenomenon as soon as possible. Professor Dade sent that one from Bonso Nkwanta. Uh, those are some of the comments All right. we received. Right. Grateful, Aisha, uh, for your time. B Madam Ruda, so we're eliminating double track. 804. Adam says he's not too sure that these projects are indeed on the ground. I'm not sure either. I you wish see. they could give us a breakdown no, of I mean, location. No, I'm just saying. Let me just say that. You see, this thing. I wish. No, you're not sure that the schools are I said that I wish they could give us locations. Then we can all go and see. This is where it is. This is where it is. But that's beside the point. When we come to free SHS, we're talking about an intervention that is meant to bring out people from underprivileged communities, mostly to have good education. And I'm asking, if we're going to do that, and you know that even the, the public schools, my, my concern is about public schools. I think that this free education should have started with public schools. People who are in public schools should have been the first beneficiaries of this free education. And the reasons are simple. If you can afford to send your child to an international school and pay 1,000 to 5,000 Ghana cities for your child to be in an international school, at the basic, uh, at the basic, basic level, what, what, why should you ask that you should also be given free education? You understand? But then you have that argument that people are saying that we also pay taxes. Fine. We also pay taxes even to go to the hospitals. But some of us go to private hospitals and some of us go to public hospitals. I am saying that at the end of the day, if you look at our public school system, the very primary or basic school that is supposed to feed into the SHS system yeah. does not have quality. Because you go around this country, you've been through your mission. You find people who have never seen a computer and they have to write the same exams with people coming from um, Christ the King and St. Mary's and whatnot. You understand? So how are you going to actually intervene for those people down there? At the end of the day, those people who are still in the rural areas that we want to have this intervention to help are the very ones who are not going to be able to make that mark to get to the SM, to, uh, uh, grade A schools. They will still be down there. So I am saying that this government did not think through this whole project of SHS. They didn't think of where the finance was going to come from. Yeah. They didn't think of the accommodation. They didn't think of the other things that could have come into like vocational technical training, how they would have revamped that before bringing out this. So at the end of the day, I am saying that the intervention is not going to the right people because at the end of the day, they are going to come out with SHS with no good grades. They can't make it to the university. Their parents will still be looking for money for them to either go and trade or learn some sort of skill, which could have been averted if they had gone through from JSS, well-trained, to either go through vocational training, technical training, a Greek or whatever. Mm. And then they match up to the SHS, where they're going to do all these grammar subjects and stuff. That is the way that I see it. But if we now just say wholesale pass, so somebody gets aggregate 50 and the person gets to go to SHS, the person cannot write uh, his, his or her name, the person cannot write, uh, construct a good sentence, you are telling me that that person is well better off? So quality is a problem. Quality is a problem. It is not just a question of telling people that your children are going to go to school free and they go to school free and they come back and sit in their villages and sit in their hamlets with no good, good grades to go to any other place. Let's, let's face it, at the end of the day, have you thought of how those children are going to go to the university? Now we have turned polytechnics, which is the middle belt. Which, which have become universities. Which has become yeah. universities. And these children are not, and those ones you should understand, are almost like practical based. So the technical, vocational, whatever, training, would have fed into those polytechnics. Now we don't have those vo vocational technical schools to feed them. So you're going to have a lot more people again fighting for the few space that is going to be in the polytechnics. The, the, the marginalized lots that we're trying to actually help are the ones who are going to fill the branch because they cannot go to university and they are going to be sitting in the house half baked. I disagree. I see. No, I 30 mean, seconds Brian, each. We are wrapping listen, up. Bright. You see, uh, Eric, one, 30 seconds, be sure. The because technical I vocational second cycle institutions are part of the free SHS. Again, 30% of all the allocations to the grade A schools goes to students coming from the uh, public sector GSS. 
that's also a given. The cash area. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thirty percent. It's given. Yeah. Thirty percent. No. 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 Not necessarily in public schools, but in the catch area. Public schools. No. Public schools. Public schools. Okay. You. You. Let me. Apart from. Apart from. Apart from. Apart from. Apart from that. Apart from that. They raise issues of quality. I have. You see. You can raise. You can raise issues with quality. There's a quality issue. You can. You can. You can sort of find. You can find. Problems and challenges with everything. I keep asking this question: mm. What would you have done with the two hundred thousand almost young people who wouldn't have who wouldn't have had an uh, opportunity to go to secondary school? Okay, I'm grateful. Why is it that? 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 The guy who is a bank manager in Accra would not take their kids to school to do skills training. Okay, the fact that you come from a village in Abompe, you have to take your kids to do skills training. I mean, come on. Allow them to wrap up. Just give me a minute or two. No, no, no. You have no time. Thirty seconds. But, 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 right, right, right. I think that, I think that the point... Oh, please, allow Adam to wrap up. Right, the point must be made that this government is playing politics with our education to the extent that most of the schools don't even have resources to print exams, papers. They, they are not... Basic school. I'm telling you, basic school and even some of the senior high schools. As I was speaking to you, a teacher just sent me a message. So, they do the flashy things without focusing on the quality. Madam raised an important issue about the basic level. Bright, when you go to most of the grade A or the category A schools in this country, 80-90% of those who are there are from the international schools and the private schools okay. who are paying much more. Okay. So focus on fixing the basic schools. I'm grateful. That is where the Madam rural Rapa folks are. That is where the poor who really need the free SHS are coming we, we, from. We are not saying that SHS is not a good Nobody thing. Nobody is free against SHS. free SHS. SHS but priority. We are saying that it is good, but we must think through. And do it and well. At the end of it, end of it is the Ghanaian child that is going to be the issue. It's the future. That's the next generation of Ghanaians we are building. So we cannot give them just any kind of education. I'm grateful. At the end but of the day, let me mm. just say something. And I want to I want to, to ask government that the Kayaye that are on the streets, three quarters of them on the streets, left school. You better start finding something for them to do. I am grateful. <laughs> Madam Rodayana is a member of the CPP. Eric Chumbe is a member of the NPP. Adam Agbana is a member of the NDC. Gentlemen, I'm grateful for your Wednesday morning. And uh, happy birthday from Modesta to Reverend Enoch Mensah Kwashi of the Faith Rock Ministry. Stay here. There's more coming up.